You're I waiting to be picked. You're waiting for permission yeah. to do a thing that you don't need permission to do. That you already have all the resources to do yourself, but there is fear and there's self-doubt that says, well, you can't do this. And they must know more than you. And the more I work with these institutions, publishers, uh, record labels, the more I see they know just as much as you. They have the same internet that you do. They can hire the same college interns that you know. A and it's not this like elite class of experts anymore. Are there still good people in the publishing industry who know a ton? Absolutely. Uh, but – if you're going to do that, be sure that you work with those people. The idea that the institution, the system is going to take care of you, that will that will cause you to starve. And you need to realize that you alone are in charge of your own success. And the deals that you make, um, the opportunities that you chase, uh, all of these are moving you in the direction of that success or they're moving you away from it. Can you bring your best work into the world and put food on the table? I'm David Cadavy, and this is Love Your Work. I'm here to help you find the clues that will lead you to your calling. You've heard it before, the story of the starving artist. You may even believe it yourself. You may think that to keep your creative integrity, you have to give up on making money. Jeff Goins is returning to the podcast today to tell you about why that's not true at all. In fact, instead of being a starving artist, you can be a thriving artist. In this episode, you're going to learn how is it that Michelangelo was actually a multimillionaire by today's standards? How did writers like John Grisham launch their careers while having a day job? How can you get leverage with publishers, record labels, or other gatekeepers so they're chasing you instead of you chasing them? What can you do to put yourself in the thriving artist mindset? Jeff's new book is called Real Artists Don't Starve, and you can get it at cadavy.net slash don't starve. No apostrophe there, of course. So if you want to be a thriving artist, you've got to sign up for FreshBooks. FreshBooks is easy to use cloud accounting software. You can create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. Set up online payments with just a couple of clicks so your clients can pay you easily. And if your clients are late in paying, which happens, you can set up FreshBooks so it will automatically send reminders so you can skip the awkward conversations. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to my listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash loveyourwork and enter love your work in the how did you hear about us section. And if you do any shipping or mailing in your business, You've got to try Send Pro from Pitney Bowes. Compare shipping rates and delivery times between USPS and other major carriers so you always get the best deal. Pitney Bowes has negotiated special rates with carriers and they pass along the savings to you. So imagine what it would do for your business if you saved three cents per stamp. Visit pb.com slash love your work. Try it free for 90 days. After that, you're going to get Send Pro for only $5 a month. Stamps.com is $15.99 a month. SendPro is only $5 a month. So that's three times the features, one third the price. That's PB as in peanut butter or pitney bows. PB.com slash love your work. And before we get to the interview, I want to thank the newest members of Love Your Work Premium, Matt Lacey, Fernando Labastida, Arif Akhtar, and Jill Fetchner will all be getting access to episodes before anyone else. Thank you for joining Join them and see a video tour of the Love Your Work Studios up on the premium page. Just go to academy.net slash premium. And as always, thank you for the reviews. We have hit a milestone. We are now well over 100 reviews in the U.S. iTunes store right now. And it's not too late to help. Just go to academy.net slash review. And there are two new ways to listen to Love Your Work. One, you can listen on your Amazon Echo through tune in just say your echo's name and i'm not going to mention it because maybe your echo is listening right now then say play love your work podcast on tune in that's play love your work podcast on tune in love your work is also now included on spotify and this is a big deal because spotify hand curates their catalog so we made the cut 
It probably helped that we were recently featured on the front page of iTunes, in case you missed that. Uh, now, this is on mobile only. Just search for Love Your Work through the Spotify app or visit cadavy.net slash Spotify. Here's Jeff Goins. I'm here with Jeff Goins, and Jeff, you just wrote this new book, Real Artists Don't Starve, which is an amazing title and I think a great message, but I'm always curious to wonder when somebody writes a book, yeah. so much work, why this particular book? So I, um, I write books to figure things out and because I'm curious about something. And for me, this really started with this story that a friend of mine sent me about Michelangelo. And apparently in 2003, this art historian by the name of Rab Hatfield found a bunch of previously unknown and unpublished bank accounts belonging to the artist Michelangelo. And in those bank accounts were very, very large sums of money. And what Professor Hatfield discovered was that Michelangelo, when he died, had about $50 million in today's currency to his name making him the richest artist of the Renaissance. And at that point, the richest artist who had ever come along. And what Michelangelo did, I came to found out. I was like, this is interesting. I didn't know this. A lot of people I've talked to said they didn't know this. They thought he was you know, maybe doing okay or starving like a lot of artists that we think you know, tend to um, do. And uh, I kind of chased this a little bit further. I was able to talk to a an expert on the life of Michelangelo, a, bi a Michelangelo biographer who's still living today. And um, he said what happened is after Michelangelo essentially broke the glass ceiling for artists in the Renaissance, he made it possible to do something that artists had never really done up to that point, which was make a good living. And in the, the latter part of the Renaissance after Michelangelo, many artists became wealthy as a result of his setting this example. And so, so I read that story, right? And then, so, you know, that's 500 years ago. And then 500 years later, uh, I am becoming a writer and I keep bumping into other creatives, uh, authors, artists, creative entrepreneurs, even musicians who are making a good living in some unusual ways. Like my friend who's a musician who makes a million dollars a year off of sponsorships of his events. And uh, the fine artist who um, is, is, is selling his artwork for less than what a lot of fine artists want to sell their paintings for, but he's just selling more of it. Uh, and he's making a lot of money through volume. And I kept bumping into these people that I now call thriving artists. And, and I was, and I was like, but, but I keep, I keep running into this idea of the starving artist. So I've got Michelangelo and all the guys that followed him who are doing really well. And then I've got all these people that I know who are thriving in their art that aren't famous or rich. They're just, they're just doing well. And yet when you talk to the average person, they go, well, you can't make money off of art. And, and I just, I, I, I didn't get that. And so I wrote this book because I felt like it needed to be written. We all know the story of the starving artist. What we're less familiar with is this story of the thriving artist. And I felt like this is something that's happening a lot. People are making a good living off of their creative work. This may be the best time in history to be creative, but we still tell this story of the starving artist as if it's the thing, it's the necessary fate of all creative people everywhere. And the message of real artists don't starve is that doesn't have to be true. You don't have to starve. You can thrive. Mm, yeah, I think that's a, a good point that right, right now is probably the best time to to be an artist and to at least like make a, make a living off of being an artist. Right. Yeah, so of course. I, and so I, I'm trying to remember, I mean, I wasn't alive then, but you know, when, when Michelangelo or Michelangelo came along, uh, you know, everybody was just kind of, uh, like, uh, they were like tradespeople artists were right. Right. And so yeah, you That's like maybe worked for the church and, and, uh, I remember there was a part in the book where Michelangelo was writing to one of his 
patrons and and basically saying, yeah, don't don't call me artist Michelangelo. Call me Michelangelo. I, I don't know how to say his last name, but uh, oh. and, and that was kind of setting an example and, and changing the, what that relationship was. Yep. 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 Yeah. He said, yeah, because they were calling him Michelangelo sculptor. And he says, don't call me sculptor. Call me Michelangelo Buonarroti. Uh, and he was saying, call me by my full name. And this was something that only noble men could do. Like, ha- like keep in mind, like uh, we didn't have last names, <laughs> you know, until like a few hundred years ago. Uh, you know, Johnson means son of John, right? Only noble people had last names. And Michelangelo grew up thinking that he was noble. And it turns out he actually wasn't. They had a they had a name, they had a, a surname, which was rare. Um, but he wasn't an aristocrat. But his whole life, his his dad told him, you come from noble blood. So when Michelangelo goes to be an artist, which as you mentioned was a blue collar job, uh, he decides he's going to I mean, he just has this mindset. Well, I have to do it as an aristocrat would do. So everywhere he goes, everything he does from how much he charges for his art to the patrons that he gets to the people that he gets to support his art, he's thinking like an aristocrat because this is his mission in life to bring his family name back into good social standing. And so, yeah, he wrote a, he wrote um, his nephew on behalf of a, a patron, a priest who basically asked him to sculpt something for him. And he says, I never kept a shop like a lot of artists do. And he's using that in a very pejorative way. Like he's saying, I'm not a shopkeeper. I'm an artist. And you will call me by my full name as you would address a lord or, you know, a cardinal or a prince. Um, treat me like you would treat basically your peers because I am that. And at this point, Michelangelo was in his 70s or 80s and he was rich, very, very rich. Uh, and 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 he's saying, I'm not like all those other guys. And I, I think this was super interesting. In, in the book, I talk about the importance of mindset uh, and really started out that way because so many creative people have a starving artist mindset. And as a result, I think they shortchange their work. If you go through life thinking you're a starving artist, artists have to starve, what inevitably is going to happen is you're going to create lackluster art and uh, it's going to show. I mean, it's got, your attitude is going to show in your work and we all know people like that, right? Like we all know people who say no for other people. They have this sort of defeated attitude and before, before they even have a chance to succeed, they've already sabotaged themselves. And – it turns out that it's possible to do the other thing, which is do what Michelangelo did and go through life with a thriving artist mindset, look for opportunities, look for ways to succeed. And it begins with thinking differently. And the book is comprised of 12 rules. And the first rule is you aren't born an artist, you become one. And that really begins with the way that you think about yourself. And and if you want to be an artist, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to go do something, it begins with this belief that you can become this different person. And before you go create great art, you first have to recreate yourself. And this is something that is kind of amazing about being a human being is we constantly have the opportunity and the privilege of getting to recreate and reimagine ourselves in different seasons of our lives. And when I was uh, doing research for the book, I kept running into people who decided at age 30, 40, 50, and sometimes beyond, oh, I'm really an artist or I'm really a writer or I really want to start this business. And, uh, and they just reimagined their lives and as a result became the artist that they wanted to be. Yeah, and with, with Michelangelo deciding that he wanted to get that respect and there must've been some things that were like going on or changing politically or economically that, that made him recognize like, Oh, I actually have the power to, to have this mindset. And, and I think today there's also things happening economically, uh, where artists are now able to be artists and and make a living at it where they have to actually recognize it and make that mindset shift in order to get into the thriving, uh, artist mindset. So, um, because I can, I can see how the starving artist mindset, th- and this is dangerous in so many different things uh, uh, like the, having the star- starving artist mindset can, 
it can be like a, an identity or a point of pride thing that a person mm-hmm. lives inside of. And yep. then that holds them back. But at the same time, they feel good about themselves because they say to themselves, well, I'm, I'm a starving artist. You know, I'm, right. I'm a, somewhat of a martyr in, in some way. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the ways that you can break through that? I do think it begins with this idea that um, you are the sum of your thoughts. And so if you want to live a different life, if you want to be a different kind of person, you have to think differently and then act differently. I, I, I sort of follow this mantra of believe, uh, behave, become, you know, like if you want to go be something else, I don't think you fake it till you make it, but I do think that you believe it till you become it. Michelangelo grew up with this, uh, idea that he was a, a nobleman and, and it, and he was pressured to be the breadwinner of the family because his uh, elder brother was uh, a priest, I think. And, and so he's going to go, you know, be a part of the church. And so now it falls on the next brother in line to take care of the family. And so when Michelangelo says, I'm going to go be an artist, his dad is disappointed because it's like saying, I'm going to go be like a carpenter. And very few men in that profession made a good living. And and so Michelangelo goes into this profession that's kind of lowly uh, with this pressure that he's got to make a living. And so he just approaches it differently. So I, I think in terms of reshaping your mindset, first you have to believe that you can become an artist or whatever it is that you want to be. Second, I think you need to find good teachers. Uh, so I call this the rule of apprenticeship. You need to find uh, people who, masters really, who are willing to invest in you and follow in their footsteps. Michelangelo does this really well. In fact, he goes to one of the most fashionable and famous painters in Florence at the time, a guy named Domenico Ghirlandaio. And he goes to him and he says, hey, um, I'm going to be your apprentice. And he's a little bit old. He's a few years older than he should have been because you're typically supposed to enter apprenticeship er- like early, 11, 12. And Michelangelo goes in there about age 13, 14. And he's kind of missed his window because an apprenticeship lasts about seven years typically. And uh, Ghirlandaio says, no, you're too old. He goes, no, you're going you're gonna to let me in. Here's the thing. You've got to pay me. Right. Like most apprentices paid to be apprenticed. It's like, you know, sending your kid to school or something. Uh, You're paying for books or whatever. And um, you're paying for this opportunity to get this education so that you can go have a good career. And Ghirlanda Dial has this studio of artists who have all, whose parents have all paid for their young boys to be there. And Michelangelo is the only kid going, no, my dad won't let me not make money. You've got, you've got to pay me to do this. And Girlo, Girlandio is so taken aback and maybe a little bit impressed that he decides to take him on. He says, okay. And he brings him on and he apprentices him. And shortly after that, about a year after that, um, uh, Lorenzo de Medici comes to the studio and says, hey, I want to take two of your artists into my palace and uh, I, I want to be their patron. And I want to continue their education in uh, you know the the royal palace. The Medici's were were the rulers of Florence at the time, and the biggest art patrons of the age. Who do you recommend? And who who would stand out to you, David? You know all these <laughs> all these kids that paid you to be there, who are doing fine work, and then this one kid who was bold enough to ask. He was audacious, and you're paying him. I think there would be a little bit of. Um, a desire to get your return on investment, uh, and and what Girlandio has seen, by the way, over the you know over the course of Michelangelo's apprenticeship, is uh, this tenacity, this willingness to do whatever needs to be done, and uh, Girlandio gives him access to uh, works of art that he can copy and learn from that the other students, the other apprentices, didn't have access to. He kind of becomes his favorite. Uh, by being this bold, brash kid who asks for more than, you know, really is necessary. So all that's that mindset stuff, right? Like he's, he's going through life thinking he's special, he's different. And I think we all can do that in our own way. We can go through life, not necessarily thinking that we're special, but that we're unique, that we have something to offer, and we can be looking for opportunities to succeed instead of looking for 
reasons to fail. I think so many people uh, just go through life with this confirmation bias. You know, oh, artists have to artists have to starve. Therefore, when I'm doing my most creative work, I'm chasing my passion, and I'm not making a living off of it. it becomes this badge of pride because this is what we think we're supposed to do. Well, Michelangelo didn't have any of that. He goes around thinking, no, 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 like I'm I'm an aristocrat. These people better treat me like one. And, and so he thinks like an artist. He acts like an artist. He studies the greats that have come before him. He finds somebody to apprentice under, and he's just stubborn enough to succeed. I think that there is something to be said for kind of treating it like your job. Like there's a certain power in the phrase, it's your job or it's my job. Yeah, like it has right. like this certain uh-huh. assumption in that phrase, just the same way somebody might be like, they're my kids. Like, of course I love them. Or, you know, yeah, there's right. a, there's an assumed, uh, depth and importance to that. When you say something, it's your job. And I think that when you are trying to do some sort of a creative craft, it's very easy to not realize that it's your job. Even if you haven't gotten to the point where you are, have figured out how to get paid for it. Like, it is your job. You have to treat, put yourself in that mindset. If you treat it like your job, it'll eventually become your job. Right. That's right. Yeah. And again, that's idea of believing and, you know, and then becoming it. I love the story of John Grisham where he thinks maybe he'd like to be a writer someday. Uh, and he doesn't even know if he has what it, what it takes. And I, I see this with people all the time. They go, oh, I want to be an artist. I want to be a musician. Well, what are you making right now? Well, I've got a job. And so what John Grisham does is he thinks he might have what it takes to be a writer, but he's not sure. So what does he do? He's a young dad. He's a brand new lawyer. So like, just imagine basically the busiest person, person ever, right? Very demanding job. Uh, lawyers tend to work lots of hours that you're sort of incentivized to work lots of hours. Uh, and you got young kids. So what he does is he goes to the office an hour early every day and he writes one page, one page of a book, this story that he has, has in his, in his mind and just to see if he can do it. And he does it for two years and he ends up writing and publishing this book called a time to kill. Great book. Doesn't sell that well published with a small publisher he goes, well, that was fun. I'm going to do another book. Does the same thing, just a page or two a day, just plodding along. Uh, a year, year later, that book comes out. This time, a major publisher buys it. This book is called The Firm. Becomes a mega bestseller. And he decides, okay, like now I can do this. Three years into the process, I have what it takes. Why? Because I've been doing this for three years and I've got two books out and I've actually already succeeded at this. This is very counterintuitive to this idea of quit your job, leap, and the net will appear. You know I'm pretty much opposed to this idea because – not because I don't like risks, but because the right risk is always – almost always – a smaller one than we think it is. And this is boring. It's not sexy. It's not a cool story to tell the internet like, oh, it took me three years of getting up an hour early just to become a writer. Like that's not cool. It's cool to quit your, you know, six-figure job and, you know, figure it out. Go all in, this, you know. <laughs> yeah, go all in. Leap in the net will appear. And it turns out this isn't the way that most creative dreams come true. I read a study not too long ago, and I talk about this in the book, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs. And it was done by the University of Wisconsin. And they did this 15-year-long study of thousands, I think it was 5,000 entrepreneurs. And they looked at two groups of people. One, people who quit their jobs and started a business. And then people who started a business kept running it on the side while they stayed at their job and then eventually quit their job. And they looked at the success rate of those two different businesses. The businesses where that, that were basically less risky, where the entrepreneurs built their businesses on the side and kept their jobs and eventually quit their jobs, were 33% more likely to succeed, whereas the others were, were much more likely to fail. And so it turns out that going all in – is actually not the best way to launch a dream, doing what John Grisham did, building it slowly and gradually on the side. It still takes risk, but that's the right risk. And what I like about that 
is it forces you to do something today because we just like to fantasize about what our life might be like someday when we actually get to do the work that we feel like we're called to do, the thing that we dream of doing. And the truth is you can do a little bit of that work today. And you can that, you feel so comfortable yeah. to to live inside that of of that, yeah. Someday, you know, when I get my chance, I'm going to do this, and then you don't yeah. even realize it's too late until you're like on your deathbed, basically. <laughs> but if you yeah. if you sit and, and and do it consistently, I love I love the story of of John Grisham. Uh, it made me think: did you did you come across Anthony Trollope at all in in your in your research as no, well? I I didn't. Uh-huh. Oh, so one of the most prolific writers of all time yeah. worked yeah, yeah. at the post office for. I think 33 years, wrote 47 novels and then a, a bunch Amazing. more and would wake up at, I think, 5 a.m. every day, three hour Incredible. writing session before his job at the post office, even hired a guy to like come wake him up, make his coffee and stuff and make sure that he that he wrote. And he just he, <laughs> he, he had a quota, 250 words per, per, yeah. per every 15 minutes. And if he finished a wow. novel during one of his sessions, he started the next one. <laughs> That's so. amazing. Yeah, that's it. I mean, T.S. Eliot was a banker and he was writing poetry you know, while working as a banker. And actually his friends, because he was so good, his friends raised a bunch of money. They pooled all their money to like break uh, T.S. Eliot free, break Tom free so he could go be a poet. Um, but yeah, this is how dreams get launched. This is how great works of art get made, uh, not by going all in, but typically building this thing slowly and gradually on the side. And sure, there are exceptions to the rule, but the rule is it takes time to build something significant. Well, I mean, this is so, you know, right on, on par with your story is that you had a job and, and you started writing and then you ended up, I think Mm -hmm. like replacing your income even before you quit your job or maybe even increasing it. Um, so yep. yeah. How much did, did your own experience, uh, tie into your desire to, to write this book? Well, so it's very important to me to not write a book about my own experience. Um, cause I think those are easily dismissed where you go, oh, that's just his experience. You know, he or she is an outlier. And, um, I didn't want to do that. And so there's a lot of other people in the book, but there's a little bit of me because this was my experience. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, David, anytime I come up with an idea or write a book or whatever, I'm thinking, first of all, does this resonate with me? Right? So I do begin with me. I start with the things that, uh, I find curious or that I don't know about. And I've always been fascinated with the relationship between art and money, and, and over the past several years, I've been reading a lot of biographies of artists and authors and, and even entrepreneurs. And uh, I kept seeing kind of the same themes emerge over and over and over again. I was reading a biography of Michelangelo when I stumbled upon this story about him. And he's kind of the archetype that's, you know, woven throughout the book, as you know. Um, and, and, and so when I was reading this and I was thinking about my own experiences, I was like, there's resonance here. And the thing that I have in common with these stories from 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago are also the same things that are seeing in that I'm seeing in my peers. So maybe there's something here more than just a good idea. Maybe there's something here more than just one person's experience. Maybe these are principles. Maybe these are timeless truths and strategies for how creative people have always succeeded. And so I wrote the book to say, yep, these things are true for me. These things are true for Jim Henson and Michelangelo and Twyla Tharp for multiple mediums and different eras. Like these things, it seems, have been always true. And uh, they can be true for you as well. So yeah, I, I, I do always start with me because I don't, I don't like reading books where it's clear that the author is very, very far removed from their subject matter. I interviewed an author one time about marketing who was a business professor and I asked this person, are you following the rules in the book about marketing to market your book? And the person responded, well, you know, you know, we, 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 cha- we change the color of the uh, book from black to orange because blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what? Like, no, the answer is no. Like you wrote a book about marketing, 
but you're not following the rules in the book to market your book. And I never want to do that. I never want to be so far removed from the subject matter that I haven't first lived it. But I, I, so I'd experienced a lot of this stuff. And at the same time, it was important to me that this was true for other people. And I just found it proven true over and over again, story after story, interview after interview. These are the things that I think creative people everywhere throughout time have always done to succeed. And if you do these things, you are much more likely to succeed. And if you don't, you're basically rolling the dice. You know, you're hoping that you get lucky. And I don't think, I don't think success is a crapshoot. I think that you follow time tested principles and sure, luck may contribute to some of it, but not all or most of it. Most of it is hard work and it's being strategic, making the right choices. And the more of the right choices and the fewer of the wrong choices you make, uh, the better off you're going to be. We're going to take a quick break. If you're a freelancer or you run a small business, you know it's important to get paid. And the more painless you can make it to get paid, the more you can concentrate on your craft. There's really no better system out there for getting yourself paid than FreshBooks. It's like mission control for everything about getting paid. Besides beautiful invoice templates, FreshBooks has time tracking. It will also automatically pull in your bank account data and categorize your expenses. FreshBooks will even remind your clients to pay you. You can skip the awkward follow-up emails. And if that wasn't enough... FreshBooks will even suggest to you quick wins. These are actions that you can take on outstanding invoices and build time that will keep your business running profitably and will get you paid. So with all this, you can imagine how FreshBooks users get paid up to four days faster. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to my listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash loveyourwork and enter love your work in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Yeah, it sounds like it's something that you kind of intuitively understood from your own experience, but then obviously you still have to have that curiosity there for you know, un- uncovering this pattern and, and, yeah. and finding those stories and everything. Were, were there any things... Uh, based on what you thought before you started writing, based on uh, compared to what you know now, are were there any surprises or or things that you were really curious about in the beginning that you had revelations about as you were uh, doing all this research and writing this book? One of the things that I struggled with, uh, and anytime you write a book and you don't struggle with something that you're talking about like I like I think that's a good thing like I think you need to be a little bit more honest and and there was a part in the book where I was r- like writing out these principles and going wait did I do this and this is the rule of ownership so this is in the latter part of the book where I realized that the most successful creative people in the world have typically ro- retained the majority stake in their intellectual property So George Lucas does this with Star Wars where uh, when he goes to finance The Empire Strikes Back, he decides that he's going to fund the whole thing himself. It cost $20 million. He basically took every dollar that he made from Star Wars and reinvested it to make the second film instead of taking an investment from Fox, which he did for the first movie. But they owned like almost 70% of the movie. And he flips it. And the second movie, he owns 77%. And he negotiates this ridiculous deal where he owns 90% of the merchandise. And they go, okay, whatever. Because he took the risk and he got the reward. And as we all know, they made billions off of those toys. And uh, you know, so that's an example. Pixar is another example. John Lasseter goes to work for Disney. Disney fires him. He goes and 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 becomes part of Pixar and really turns it into an animation studio. A few years later, Disney wants to hire him back for triple his salary. He says, "No, I'm having way more fun here, and I have ownership here. I have control over the art." So I'm writing this, and I'm going, "Well, I just sold this book to a publisher, like." I have actually sold ownership of this. I'll get a royalty, but I sold this. And and so a lot of these things have um, – uh, they're sort of paradoxes. And so one of the things that I realized with ownership is it's not that you never sell your work off to somebody. 
It's that you need to do it for the right price and for the right reasons. So it makes sense sometimes for an author to sell his book to a publisher if it means he's going to reach more people and the money he gets is more than enough to sustain himself while and after he's writing. And if he's got some other strategy for the book that you know goes beyond getting paid for book sales, which is you know my case. Uh, and, and, you know, you see this with like Dr. Dre, right? You know, he went through his life doing, um, basically doing a series of bad business deals. And his first, you know, he, his first band, NWA, uh, they're world famous. They, they basically usher West coast hip hop into the world. They say, this is a thing, right? And all these groups and, and rappers after them, I mean, they set the model. So, you know, Snoop Dogg, Tupac, they all follow NWA. These guys made pennies on the dollar off of their work while the record label and the managers are making bank. They were cheated because they didn't know any better because they were teenagers. And, and then he goes, starts uh, uh, a, uh, a record label uh, called Death Row with Suge Knight, who's basically a thug and uh, is like, you know, making business deals with baseball bats. <laughs> and and Dre goes, I'm out of here. This is not a good place to be. Walks away from a 50% in a $20 million company. And it goes through these series of bad business deals, eventually starts Aftermath, signs um, 50 Cent and Eminem, uh, ends up creating Beats, and you know we we know the rest of the story where he sells Beats to Apple for seven hundred million dollars. I think you're wearing Beats right now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I am. <laughs> so it just shows you how far it's uh, right. How far uh, yes, that took exactly. him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, so he did sell it right for seven hundred million dollars. Uh, I think it makes sense to give up ownership of your work if. Uh, somebody else can make it better. I think this was the case for George Lucas. He was done with Star Wars. He said in an interview, what is the point of making more movies if nobody's going to like them, if everybody's just going to criticize you for them, which is what happened with the prequels, right? Um, so he was done. He was burnt out. He had created something and he could only take it so far. And so he gives it over to Disney and says, you guys take it the rest of the way. And uh, Dre, on the other hand, had seen what had happened when you sell out too soon, right? When you give your work away too quickly and somebody is going to take care of you. That's a bad idea. It happens in the music business all the time. And so he really held on to ownership of Beats until it just made absolute sense to partner with Apple, you know, uh, with iTunes and, uh, you know, the number one music distributor in the world and find a way to partner uh, with them where he was still creatively involved, but also, you know, had a really big cash out, became one of the very first billionaire musicians in the world. So that was something that I struggled with. That was surprising to me. Um, the other thing I struggled with is I believe in generosity. I really do. Uh, but I found that most starving artists are too generous. They're giving away all their work. They're not valuing uh, their creations. And it, it turns out that to be a thriving artist, you have to charge something. You have to work for something. Uh, you can't be giving away your work all the time because if you don't take yourself seriously, nobody else will. And that that's something that I still struggle with. I like being generous, uh, but I realize like you have to be intentional. You have to be strategic. If you're giving away your art, it needs to be because you're trying to market yourself, not just because you think someday somebody's going to turn around after years of you giving them stuff for free and say, I'll pay you for this. It doesn't work that way. You can't work. Opportunity is too vague. You need to be giving away samples of your work and chalking it up to marketing. Uh, or the other thing is you just need to be charging a little bit, right? Uh, and then over time, you can charge more and more and more. And so the idea of ownership that thriving artists own the majority of their work and, and, and starving artists tend to sell out too soon. And, uh, this idea that you can't give away your best work for free all the time. You need to always charge something. You need to always work for something. Even if that something is, I'm going to intentionally give this away to this community because I know it's going to return to me in the form of blank, you know, uh, more people or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so tricky as you mentioned, because, uh, 
you know, the way that media works right now or the way that art spreads is that you part of the model is you kind of give it away for free. And, uh, you know, I've, I've run into a, an issue similar about this ownership thing. Uh, recently I had a chance to join a podcast network and it was like this big successful podcast network. And I'm like, wow, Mm. this is really my big break. And I took a couple weeks to, to think about it. And I really looked over everything. And then I realized like, wow, this is kind of a, shitty deal like this is not <laughs> yeah. i'm mean, gonna have to give up a lot i mean like, there's a p- yeah. good potential upside but but who really knows so i actually ended up turning it down yeah. and you know i'm experimenting with things like premium level of the podcast i'm reaching out to advertisers myself and having more success than i thought that i would have because you know previously maybe i just didn't want to do the ad sales or something mm-hmm. like that and then so so it's it's, it's, a, tr- it's a trade-off i know like my first book I often say I don't think I could have possibly written my first book without the publisher, without them putting the money down and even mm. even finding me and saying like, oh, this is a great idea. There should be a book. But now I'm in the middle of writing a book right now that I'm, I'm starting to find it difficult to find reasons to to uh, to try to get a publisher for it. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally get that. And I wrestle with that all the time, every day. And I think if you're doing that, you're okay. I think the person who finds themselves in trouble is going, this one thing, you know, this person signing me, this deal, this opportunity, this is going to be my big break. I love the story. I heard this first from Stephen Pressfield. Story of a new actor moves to town, moves to Hollywood, and is at a party talking to Walter Matthau, who's kind of at the peak of his career at the time. And uh, kid says to Matthau, um, man, I'm really struggling. And, and Matt thought goes, well, what's, what's going on? And the kid says, um, well, I'm just waiting for my big break. And Matt Thau says, kid, it's not the one break. It's the 50 breaks. And I think that's, I mean, that's the difference between a starving artist mindset, which is like work, 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 work. And then maybe someday I'll get lucky versus the thriving artist who is intentionally making breaks happen creating opportunities, not selling out too soon or giving up control of their work. Because when you do that, it's okay to sell your work to a publisher or um, you know, join a podcast network or whatever, so long as you understand what you're giving up and what you're getting in return. But when you say, this is my salvation, as a lot of musicians in Nashville where I live tend to do, if I could just get the record label to, to, to sign me, that I would could be just great. Get picked. You're I'm waiting to be picked. You're waiting for permission yeah. to do a thing that you don't need permission to do. That you already have all the resources to do yourself, but there is fear and there's self-doubt that says, well, you can't do this. And they must know more than you. And the more I work with these institutions, publishers, uh, record labels, the more I see they know just as much as you. They have the same internet that you do. They can hire the same mm-hmm. college interns that you know. And it's not this like elite class of experts anymore. Are there still good people in the publishing industry who know a ton? Absolutely. Uh, But if you're going to do that, be sure that you work with those people. The idea that the institution, the system is going to take care of you, that will will cause you to starve. And you need to realize that you alone are in charge of your own success. And the deals that you make – um, the opportunities that you chase, uh, all of these are moving you in the direction of that success or they're moving you away from it. Uh, I was speaking with Seth Godin a, a few weeks ago for the podcast and he said something that, re- that really flipped a switch in me, which is he had a bookshelf behind him kind of like you do right now. And he motioned to the bookshelf behind him. He's like, all these books here, they're all bestsellers. Every single one was a surprise. If, if, if publishers knew what was going to be a bestseller, <laughs> they would just pick the bestsellers. That's right. They don't know. I mean, they, they, they are, I think there is a lot of like, like my, my first, I tried to write a proposal for the book that I'm writing now. I mean, it was, it's, it was totally different. Mm-hmm. Now, if I go back and look at that proposal, I realize publishers really know a lot about positioning a book and, and, and making it they a do. saleable book. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and so I've, I've learned some of that stuff, but I just can't, I just can't uh, muster the will to write a book mm-hmm. proposal, I think, is the mm-hmm. thing, because it just seems like wasted energy 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's useful because you do get to think about marketing and positioning and, and stuff like that. But then you're, you're 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 doing all this writing that isn't part of the final product. You know. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, yep. It, it, I mean, all of your books have been with publishers, haven't they? The first book was self-published. Oh, okay. It did really well. And every book I write, I think, should I self-publish this or traditionally publish? And I go back and forth. And I think it has to be the right book, the right publisher, the right partnership. But I will say early on, I was, I just, there was this luster of working with a publisher. I got picked. I felt special. And the more I've done this, the more um, aggressive I've gotten, the more I've negotiated better deals and retained rights to certain things. And at the end of the day, I, I, I assume that they don't have my best interest in mind. They have their best interest in mind, which is what they should have in mind. And, and I need to have my best interest in mind. And so I don't just look at a contract and go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to sign this. Um, I, I go, what do I absolutely want out of this. And even when I do a book deal, I'm still taking full responsibility for the book. I talked to a, an author who has sold half a million books and very successful, uh, big, big author who's just getting bigger every day. And I just, I, you always assume that somebody like knows something that you don't know, or they're doing something that you're not doing, or they got a better deal right? Or the better publisher or whatever. So I'm talking to this person, I go, hey, how do you like working with that publisher, right? And he goes, oh, I like that they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was the most he could say about this, you know, major publisher that I just assumed was doing all kinds of things for him. I like that they pay me. So, you know, if they pay you enough, it makes sense. But beyond that, you know, not necessarily. Um, and, and Seth is right. You know, they knew, if, if they if they knew what was going to sell, they would just sign those books. They don't. They sign twenty books, knowing nineteen are going to fail, and hoping one is mm-hmm. is a great is a great bestseller. And one path I'm considering right now is actually I'm already getting paid to write the book because I'm sending it out in in, in emails each chapter every cool. a day for thirty days, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'm already getting paid because some people are paying me and some people are are, are donating and stuff. Wow. And, uh, cool. I, I might try like what near Eyal did, which is he, he wrote hooked and mm-hmm. he basically did all blog posts and then, uh, self-published. And then mm-hmm. once it was self-published, it sold well enough that then he went and got a book deal for the hardcover. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, he didn't have to write a proposal. So that's like the most appealing part to me. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I mean, do you have to write a proposal for, uh, for great artists don't starve? Or sorry, yeah, real artists real don't artists. starve. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, but for me, a proposal is an outline. Yeah. It's an out. It's an outline in the first chapter. So it is. It's useful. You know. That's true. Um, all the other stuff, like you know, hey, here's my platform and all all that crap. Um, yeah. I mean, not as not as useful when you're writing your third, fourth, or fifth book. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, every time I write a book, I've got to write a proposal and say, you know, here's what this is worth to me and here's why it's worth that to me. And I will, and I know every time I write a book, I know I can go self-publish it because I've done it before and I have, you know, I've had a successfully self-published book. So when I go to publisher, I'm going, what are you going to pay for? What are you going to bring to the table? And why are these things I can't do myself? Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it's a great age to um, think about that. When I, when I talk to writers who are thinking about publishing, they go, should I self-publish or traditionally publish? I go, well, how many traditional publishers are knocking on your door right now? If the answer is none, then it's not really a choice. Uh, you need to go self-publish. And I think that's a great first step. Uh, well, for if you try to traditionally publish in that, and I think that this is this is all relevant to the larger idea of do you work with a bigger entity or not, is that if they aren't knocking on your door, then what leverage do you have? Exactly. Instead, there's so many things you can do that where you have so much leverage that they're clamoring mm-hmm. to, to, uh, to work with you. And, you. and you have the freedom to walk away. That's right. Yeah. And I always have that freedom, which like, as you said, gives me leverage versus going, oh, oh, I'll do whatever you say. Those deals never really end up working out too well because mm-hmm. you've got a lot of hope in them. 
and you're doing, you know, whatever they want, and they've got leverage, and and that's not a good place to be. You know, I, we, we've heard this before. You don't get what you deserve; you get what you negotiate. And, and in order to negotiate, you've got to be able to have something to bring to the table. I, I heard Seth say one time, "We used to have to chase publishers to publish books. Now we need to stop chasing publishers and start chasing readers. Because what do publishers want? They want the readers. And if you go, I've got the readers." Now you get to choose, right? That's the hardest part is getting the readers. Now you get to choose whether or not you want to do this yourself, which is pretty easy these days, uh, or partner with the publisher to try to reach more people or you know sell your book for the right price point. But the question is not, do I publish this thing or not? The question is, is there a demand for it? Mm-hmm. Do I have readers? If not, that's where you need to start. Build the audience. Yeah, and I think people in any creative field... Uh can often fantasize or imagine that, oh, to, to become a filmmaker, they've got to make a big d- deal for a feature film. To get a, to become a writer, they have to, to get a book deal. To become a musician, they have to get a record deal. And all those things are so far removed from what step one looks like, mm-hmm. which is to actually, mm-hmm. in some small form, do that work. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, absolutely. And I believe that all art needs an audience. And it turns out this is something that uh, all great artists do is uh, in one form or another, they're building their audience by sharing their work, putting it out there. I love the story of Pablo Picasso uh, marching across town every day to paint Gertrude Stein. And he did this uh, reputedly about 100 times. Why did he do this? Well, because she was the connector. She was the patron. She was the person who was hold, holding weekly salons at her house in, uh, on the left bank in Paris, having all these artists and art patrons and people over in her house sh- introducing everybody. So that's the person to connect with. And Picasso gets this. And so what does he do? He goes, I'm going to put my art in front of the person who can help it spread. And these people, these patrons are people all around us today. They're people like you, David. They're podcasters and bloggers and people with Etsy shops and big Instagram accounts and people on Facebook. So there's not like an elite few who all, who hold all the attention. There are millions of influencers depending on what the niche is that you want to reach. You just have to connect with these people. And it's not that hard. You've got to have good work and you've got to be able to share it. And the artists who do this succeed and those who don't, who've got their novel in their drawer, who have that brilliant idea in the back of their head, they get the attention they deserve, which is none. Mm -hmm. You've got to put it out there. And as an author, I always, one of the things that impresses me so much about the the book is that, um, is is the stories. Just like Mm -hmm. amazing, great, appropriate stories that I haven't necessarily heard anywhere else. Um, (laughs) Thanks. How do you have a system for collecting those and organizing them and and having them available when it when when the time comes? I got a good tip from my friend Derek Halpern years ago. Oh yeah. Uh, And I said, "How do you like?" He he reads a lot, and he only reads hard copy books. Like he doesn't read digital. He reads a book like that, five times. I can times. tell you that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what he says. I, I, went, I went to Barbados with him once. I mean, not just, <laughs> yeah, not just him and I, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but yeah, he, he had a Kindle. Getaway. So now it's, but yeah, he does read a lot. of. <laughs> so I only read hard Sorry, anyway. I ruined your story. <laughs> <laughs> well, You're he welcome. Says, he, says that a lot. <laughs> uh, he, I said, how do you find new books to read? He says, I read the bibliography. And I was like, I've like never thought to do that. So he reads the bibliographies of his favorite books. Um, So I started doing that. So typically when I'm doing research for a book, and I'm almost always working on a book, um, I, I start with an idea. This, for me, it was the Michelangelo article. So the next step was, how do I find out more about this guy, Rab Hatfield? He wrote a book, um, I've got it right here. Uh, he wrote a book called "The Wealth of Michelangelo." It and you had a, six, it was hard to find it. I saw that in the in your bibliography notes. It was super hard to find, <laughs> and I paid I paid a hundred dollars. It's for not this on book. Kindle. 
<laughs> it was, I mean, it's like an academic book, you yeah, know, there right. was like a 800 of them printed and it's out of print. I had to go to some old library site that repub re sells old library books. And I found it. Um, and I read it and then I read a bunch of Michelangelo biographies and then I started reading bibliographies of those books. And I just, you know, like it's just this thread. And so when I read, when I write a book, I'm doing that and I'm also reading, um, contemporary stuff about the subject. So this is a book about creativity and business basically. So I'm reading, you know, Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind. And, uh, I'm reading Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book about creativity. Like I'm reading all the modern books that have been written past 10, 20 years about the subject. Then I'm reading what they're reading. And I'm asking myself, is there an argument that I could make here that hasn't been made before? Because if there is, then I'm, I don't need to make it. But if not, if there's a gap where I can kind of fill, then I, you know, then I write the book and um, I will go to Amazon and I will like search a book and then I'll look at the suggested books and I like buy all those books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bought hundreds of books for uh, the writing of this book and I threw out probably a third of them and I read them, you know, or skimmed through them. I said, oh, this isn't work. This is going to work. This isn't going to work. But typically, you know, one book leads to another and so on. And then when you actually find one of the stories though, what's, do you have a capture system for that? Or you just put a sticky note in there or how does that work? <laughs> I don't, you know, Ryan Holiday is really good at this. He's yeah. got a whole note, note card system. I was like, oh, that's good. I wish I were that organized. Uh, uh, I think it was, I think it's Hemingway who said this, um, that, you read a book and, uh, if it's, if it's good enough, you'll remember it. Mm -hmm. I think that was his, his, his quote. Um, that's sort of my system. I read a lot and if a book is really good, I will read it again. And this, and the story that jumps out at me is the story that jumps out at me. Uh, and, and I buy the book on Kindle so that I can search the Kindle and find the story again. <laughs> Uh, so no, no sticky notes. I read a bunch of books. I'm always reading. And what I'm looking for is, uh, light bulbs. So the Michelangelo story is a light bulb. I go, that's interesting. And it, and it turns out I've just been reading a bunch of books about artists and authors. Cause I'm fascinated with that. And immediately I'm thinking, oh, this is true for Van Gogh. And this is true for Picasso. And mm -hmm. this is true for this person and Jim Henson and this and this. And, and I just, I'm just reading all the time and then something sparks an insight. And then I kind of pull everything together and basically go back and read those books that I'm already familiar with. So when I start writing a book, David, 50% of the research is already done accidentally. Like I'm always reading. And then all of this happens too. But when I start writing, I start thinking about stuff. And I go, oh, that reminds me of such and such. And I'll just go back and I'll pull that, that story in. It's not a very neat way. you know. It's not a very like clean way to um, write a book but it's the only way I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I tried the Ryan Holiday method myself with the index cards and stuff, but I, I, I tend to be a little minimalist since I live in a different country and yeah. and all that stuff. Right. But I did find one thing that, well, I'm also forced to buy Kindle books pretty much because English language books right. are very difficult to come by where I'm at, which right. I, I groaned about at first, but then I realized I started color coding my highlights. So if I see a story that I think fits a theme that... that uh, I might want to write about someday, then I highlight that blue. And mm. I didn't even realize until I started writing the book that I'm writing now that yeah, like, yeah, all, a lot of this research is kind of already done. I just need to open the Kindle app and search around and find the right passages if, if I need to check facts and stuff, if, if it's not the stuff that's just in my brain. Yeah, it's good. Typically, I'm, I'm pulling stories, as you said. And so I will read a book. I will internalize a story. I will remember it. I will go back, I will retell the story, and then I'll pull up the source for like a quote or something. But I'm I'm retelling the story, so I don't need to know it word for word. I'm just getting the gist of it and then fact-checking it to make sure, sure. You know, it's accurate. Oh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for letting me uh, you know, pick your brain as an author as well, in sure. addition to yeah. talking about the book uh, Real Artists Don't Starve, which is fantastic. Definitely check it out. Um, cool. Do you have a final message to sum up our conversation today. I think the the thing that I try to sort of distill the message of the book down to, and um, I, I write a book to distill a message. Um, I think it was uh, Ryan who who told me he goes, 
you know, people go like, what is the message of your book in two sentences? He's like the, like the point of writing a book is like you write a book because this is like the simplest way to say the thing that you knew how to say. So it takes 200 pages to say it. Uh, you know, so that's the simplest you can say it. Uh, I, I thought that was funny, but I can say mine in a sentence. <laughs> um, I, I wrote this book because I see so many people struggling. They're very talented. They're very skilled. Uh, they're struggling to get paid or get attention around their art. And they're just, they're missing something. And, and telling themselves the story of the starving artist, you have to starve, you have to struggle, is not helpful. It's hurting their art. It's hurting their best creative work. And so I wrote this book to offer hope, a challenge. Like if you're a real artist, then don't starve. You don't have to starve. I believe, and here's the one sentence, that being a starving artist today is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. So whether or not you starve is up to you. Great. And where would you like people to go to find more of you? To learn more about the book, go to don'tstarve.com. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever. And if you go to don'tstarve.com, there's some bonuses there where um, if you order the book, you can you know just f- fill out a little form and, and get some free stuff as well. And that's don'tstarve.com. Great. Thanks so much for coming, Jeff. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me, David. that conversation with Jeff Goins helps you muster the will to make your work real and to get paid for it. For more on taking action to make your art, listen to Seth Godin on episode 77. You know, you're showing up every day doing a podcast. It's an extraordinarily generous act. There's not a short line between here and success. There is a long line and you're on it, but you're learning every time you do it. How much does it cost you to start doing a podcast? Nothing. Right. But there's all these other people who are waiting for podcasting central to call them on the phone and say, will you please do a podcast? And no one's going to call. Again, Seth is on episode 77. Or listen to Adrian Holovati's story of keeping ownership over his business. He sold a business, watched it get dismantled, and now he's staying independent. And you have to care about it. And how can you work that hard if it's not something you care about? Right. And then... Bring along with that, well, if you care about it so much, why do you want to get rid of it someday and flip it? Right. Yeah, exactly. Adrian is on episode six. And if you appreciate all the work that goes into making this show, you can help support it. One way is to subscribe, 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 whether it's on Apple Podcasts or Overcast or wherever you get your podcasts, just hit the subscribe button. Another is to rate the show on Overcast. It's really easy. Just tap the star icon on this episode on Apple Podcasts. Just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review and click on the star rating. And you don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple of seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Premium. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You can even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance. And you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to cadavy.net slash premium. That's cadavy.net slash premium. Love Your Work is brought to you by top Love Your Work Premium members, such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>